It is 10 o'clock, so it's time for us to get started. We're in Joshua chapter 7, and we started in with verse 1 last week, just to kind of set the, the backdrop for what happens at AI. We have this prologue uh, that sets the stage for what's about to happen at AI. Joshua 7, 1, But the people of Israel broke faith in regard to the devoted things. For Achan, the son of Carmi, son of Zabdi, son of Zerah, of the tribe of Judah, took some of the devoted things, and the anger of the Lord burned against the people of Israel. All right, we noted at the end of last week's class, this word anger only appears three times in the book of Joshua. Two of them are here. You know, so we just read the first one, where the anger is burning against Israel. At the end of the chapter, uh, we're going to read this notice that the Lord's anger has ceased to burn against Israel. And then there's one more time at the very end of the book, in chapter 23, um, where it, it is a warning against Israel not to commit any kinds of sins or breaches against the covenant, or the Lord will be angry with them. In other words, we are looking at the one instance in the book of Joshua where we are told that the anger of the Lord burns against Israel. Compare that with like 10 times in Exodus, 15 times in Numbers, 13 times in Deuteronomy. As we're reading through Israel traveling in the wilderness, it's like, you know, they, they can't turn the corner without breaking faith with God or complaining about something. And the reaction is the same almost every time. The anger of the Lord burns against the sons of Israel. Um, we see it all the time in the law of Moses. This is the only time that we see it in the book of Joshua. Um, so we had thought, as we read through chapter 6, it looks like Israel has been faithful in everything. Um, everything is to be harem. So for the city, that means burning it down. Uh, for everything that lives, it means killing it. Um, for all of the gold and silver and bronze and iron, that means that all of that goes into the treasury of the Lord. Uh, and Israel, as far as we could see in the, uh, the siege or the, the sack of Jericho, Israel was faithful in that. Except, now we learn, who broke faith? In chapter 7, verse 1. Hmm? The sons of Israel. Good, that was a trick question. I was trying to get you all to say Achan. That's not what the text says. The text says the sons of Israel broke faith in regard to the devoted things. Now, it's clear that it's the actions of this one man, Achan, that's done it. But who bears the guilt for it? The entire nation. In fact, something interesting happens in this verse. We read about Achan, the son of Carmi, son of Zabdi, son of Zerah, of the tribe of Judah. Now, we've been in the Old Testament long enough that we probably, you know, this, this genealogy hit us and probably didn't even phase us. Because we're, just, we're used to genealogies by now. Reading the Hebrew scriptures, they come up all the time. Um, but I want you to think back over the course of the book of Joshua. Whose genealogies have we gotten so far in the book of Joshua? Have we gotten anybody else's genealogy? So we've kind of, like, with, with Joshua himself, we just get that he's Joshua the son of Nun. That's it. There's no, there's no extended genealogy. And that's just the way that he's referred to constantly. Joshua, the son of Nun. Achan's genealogy is the first extended genealogy that we've gotten in the book. And that should stand out to us. It's interesting that this one guy, Achan, gets a genealogy. And I think it serves really just this one purpose. To associate what Achan has done with Israel to show that it's not just treated as an individual sin, but is going to be treated as a corporate sin. That Israel 
as a whole is being held to account for what has happened here. And this is just as the law warned, by the way. Right? If, you, if you take any of the harem, uh, we read in Deuteronomy 13, you guys become harem. Right? Not just the one who takes it, but the nation becomes harem. Uh, we read something similar about murder as well. Right? If you find somebody um, who's been murdered and you don't know who does it, you have to go through this ritual to cleanse the land because if you don't, there's going to be blood guilt on the land. And that affects not just the person who committed the murder, you know, who's, who's done it in secret and is getting away with it. That, that curse comes down on the entire nation of Israel. All right, you look at the, the way that this builds up um, in Achan's genealogy. Achan, son of Carmi, son of Zabdi, son of Zerah, of the tribe of Judah, and it builds us right up to you know, the anger of the Lord burned against the sons of Israel. A lot of our English translations render the word for sons as people. That's, that's the basic meaning of it. Um, B'nai Israel, the sons of Israel. We we're, were meant to understand that as the nation of Israel. But it's literally sons of Israel. You've got Achan, the son of Carmi, son of Zabdi, son of Zerah, of the tribe of Judah, son of Israel. Judah's literally son of Israel. This ties Achan to the whole nation, the sons of Israel. And so we will see this guilt play out, not just against Achan, although that happens, um, but against Israel first. And it starts immediately in the text. Uh, let's go in, uh, straight into verse 2. We'll read through verse 5. Joshua sent men from Jericho to Ai, which is near Beth Avon, east of Bethel, and said to them, Go up and spy out the land. And the men went up and spied out Ai. And they returned to Joshua and said to him, Do not have all the people go up, but let about two or three thousand men go up and attack Ai. Do not make the whole people toil up there, for they are few. So about 3,000 men went up from there, I'm sorry, went up there from the people. And they fled before the men of Ai. And the men of Ai killed about 36 of their men and chased them before the gate as far as Shevarim and struck them in the, at the descent. And the hearts of the people melted and became as water. Okay. Oh, and I told you last time, uh, this, this just strikes me as funny. It works in English. Um, you know, we always pronounce the city's name as AI because, I don't know, you look at that name on the page and that doesn't really work in English. The letter A followed by the letter I. Like, that's not a word. Um, how does that work? So we just say AI. Um, in Hebrew, it's pronounced AI, which strikes me as funny because of what it means. The, the name AI means ruins or heap of ruins. Uh, and in English, yeah, the sound makes sense. That's exactly the kind of sound that you would make if you were in ruin or a heap of ruins. Aye! Um, so, now I'm not going to continue doing that through the class, by the way. I'm going to keep calling it AI, like normal. But I, that, I got a kick out of that. Um, so the name of this place is AI. Ruins or heap of ruins. All right, so right from the outset here, we already know what's going to happen to this city because it's being called by the name of what's going to happen to it. All right, Joshua sent men from Jericho to the ruins. Oh, I wonder what's going to happen to that place. Right, and evidently at this time, it is a major city, uh, but it is known as the ruins. We know what's going to happen to it, but at this point in the story, Right, it's uh, ironic. At this point in the story, the ruin is Israel's because of what has happened, because the sons of Israel broke faith in regard to the harem. And we get a sense of this, this, this ruin is prefigured for us pretty much immediately in the text. 
Joshua sends these men from Jericho to Ai. He tells them, go up and spy out the land. They go up and spy out the land. They bring back their report. Is there anything that is conspicuously absent from this story? Solomon? Uh, the word of the Lord. Now, up to this point, and I hope it hasn't gotten too tedious the way that I have kept pointing this out over the course of the book of Joshua. Um, but it, it keeps happening where we go through this pattern. The Lord speaks to Joshua. Joshua relates the command to the sons of Israel um, or to you know, the chiefs in charge of the sons of Israel. And then those chiefs relay it to the rest of the people. And we get like this chain of command and a chain of obedience uh, where we find that Joshua is obedient to the Lord and faithful to, to what he says. He's faithful in relaying that to Israel. And the sons of Israel as a whole are faithful in following Joshua's command uh, as God's uh, appointed um, replacement for Moses. They are faithful to the words of the Lord. We've seen that chapter after chapter in the book of Joshua. Again, so many times uh, that perhaps it strikes us as repetitive, but that sets us up specifically to notice this detail in chapter 7. Right? By, the, by the time that we hit AI, the Lord's absence from this should scream at us. The Lord does not speak to Joshua. We don't know where Joshua is getting this order from to go out and spy out the land. Uh, these instructions resemble, well, I mean, the connection should be kind of obvious. Um, who else is commanded to go up and spy out the land? Yeah, Caleb and Joshua and the other ten. Right? This, this is supposed to make us think back to Numbers 13 um, and the command that Moses gives. There, by the way, we read the command explicitly coming from the Lord. Right? The Lord said to Moses, have men go up and spy out the land. And so Moses does that and they bring their report back. So we're supposed to have uh, this episode in mind. All right? Already, we see that, uh, that the word is not coming from the Lord. Uh, but we find other things here that prefigure Israel's defeat, that foreshadow what's going to happen. Um, in the book of Numbers, the spies come back, and the majority of them... Um, what, what do they say about the number of people living in Canaan? Do they, have a, do they have an accurate read on the strength of Canaan? Now, uh, well, you remember that uh, so, you know, the 12 spies come back, and it's only Joshua and Caleb who say, yeah, we can go up and take the land. What do the rest of the spies say about the land of Canaan? How do they characterize it? Yeah, you got all these giants. What else, Rena? Well, I, they just said they were, the cities were fortified and large. Cities are fortified and large. There's, they're huge. Not just like physically big and intimidating, but there's lots of them. These people are way too strong. Not just strong physically, but strong in number. Right? They overestimate the strength of Canaan. And Israel chooses not to go up. And we know the rest of the story. That whole generation wanders in the wilderness until they die. Now these spies in Joshua 7, they go up and they spy out Ai. Do they have an accurate read on the strength of Ai? No, except notice here it's running in the opposite direction. Whereas the former spies overestimated the strength of Canaan, here... These spies dramatically underestimate the strength of AI. All right, now what truly matters, of course, on both occasions is the Lord. Right? The, the great number of Canaanites in Numbers 13 means nothing if the Lord is with Israel. Whereas the, um, the small number of people in AI here in Joshua 7 
also means nothing if the Lord is not with Israel. Right? AI could have been a toad sitting on a stone, and it still would have beat Israel, because the Lord is not with Israel here. And there's something else that we should notice about the spies' uh, report and their advice. Well, they, they don't just report. They give their advice. Notice that in verse 3. In fact, they begin with the advice. What is their advice? Don't have all the people go up, but let about two or 3,000 men go up and attack AI. Don't make the whole people toil up there, for they are few. Now, so far in the book of Joshua, what has been the pattern for the conquest? How much of Israel is supposed to participate in the conquest? All Israel. And that was a big deal at the beginning of the book because you have these two and a half tribes over on the east side of the Jordan. And the fear is that their fighting men are not going to participate in the conquest on the western side of the Jordan. And a big part of the story is how those two and a half tribes keep faith with Israel. And they send their fighting men. Um, and all Israel participates in the conquest of the land. Here, now, the spies are advising not all of the people. Don't make the whole people toil up there, for they are few. Now, um, let's, let's give some spoilers here. I think just to, um, to demonstrate what we're saying here is the correct read on this. We skip ahead to chapter 8, verse 1, and we find almost all of these troubles reversed. Chapter 8, verse 1, after the sin of Achan is dealt with, the Lord said to Joshua, Do not fear and do not be dismayed. Take all the fighting men with you and arise, go up to Ai. See, I have given it into your hand, or so I've given into, the, into your hand the king of Ai and his people, his city, and his land. All right, so just there in one verse, all of these problems that we have been seeing in the, the spies and the report of the spies here in chapter 7, all of these are reversed. Now we have the voice of the Lord. And now the Lord is saying, I'm going to give you AI. And the Lord is saying, take all the fighting men there. Whereas these spies are saying, don't make everybody go up there. The Lord says, yeah, make everybody go up there. And that's going to lead to the fall of AI in chapter 8. All right, so we've got all of these things compounding in chapter 7. All of these, it, it starts with this one breach of faith. It starts with Achan, and then we suddenly see everything unraveling. Whereas Joshua has always listened for the voice of the Lord before, now he's just giving orders. Uh, whereas Israel had been eager to participate together, now they're just sending a few by themselves. And so these 3,000 men went up to Ai, and they fled before the men of Ai. And the men of Ai killed about 36 of their men, and chased them before the gate as far as Shavarim, and struck them at the descent. Uh, the, the place that they chased them to, Shevarim, means quarries. Um, all right, and this, this gives us some sense, by the way, what's going on. They chase them to a quarry, and Israel is being routed so badly that they're just they're running down into this rock pit. Right? And the text tells us uh, that they chased them and struck them at the descent. Um, all right, so you can imagine Israel you know, trying to work their way down into this quarry area, and the men of Ai holding the high ground behind them, and just picking them off like fish in a barrel. Um, the, the word for quarries, it, I mean, you, you can see it in English there well enough. The root of it is 
Um, in, in Hebrew, it makes the SH sound. Shavar or Shavar. Um, so when you have multiple Shavars, plural Shavar, that's a quarry. But the word Shavar um, by itself just means to break or to crush something. Right? So a quarry is a place where you bust up rocks. Right? That's where they get their word for quarry. It's the busting up place. And of course, Israel now is chased to this place where they are crushed. They are busted up on the descent. We finally get Israel's reaction at the end of verse 5. The hearts of the people melted and became as water. All right, where have we heard this description? Hmm? Yeah, yeah, for, uh, for the Canaanites. This is the description we've heard a couple of times already uh, for the Canaanites in general. Not just Jericho, but all of them. Rahab said it back in chapter 2. The text told us it again in chapter 5, verse 1. And that's, that's what we're used to seeing. That's the way things ought to be. Because when the Lord is with Israel, the fear of the Lord is on Israel the inhabitants of the land. And they can't even stand before Israel. And now everything has been turned upside down. Everything is backwards. Now it's the hearts of the people of Israel that have melted and become as water. So everything is just exactly the opposite of the way it should be. All right. Any questions or comments before we continue into the chapter? Solomon? Um, I noticed that, and maybe this is like insight on how the battle with Israel actually go, mm -hmm. there were 3,000 men, yet only 36 died. And then that caused them to be scared and flee? Yeah. You know? so well, and that's that, that. That gives us some sense that the Lord's judgment is on Israel. Yeah. That they can suffer what what to us probably seem like a fairly minor defeat and it makes them quake. Yeah. yeah. So either yeah, so either they're just scary cats and God has been like, you know, just giving them like like he says, I'll give you I gave you uh Jericho. Yeah, it's all on the Lord. Or uh that well, I forgot what the other option was. Yeah. So it's either that happens or uh they are so uh, they are so victorious whenever they go there that they're not used to seeing their own men die. Yeah. Like David says in the Psalms, uh, mm -hmm. he basically says that the Lord has protected like all our men. Every time we go to battle, we're going to die. Yeah, and that that gives us that, that's I think that's useful to read back into chapter six as well. Like we noted a couple of times that whenever the walls fall and they go into Jericho, we don't read anything about an actual fight. Right? Israel suffers zero casualties at Jericho. They have, before this, suffered, as far as we know, zero casualties in entering Canaan and beginning the conquest. Um, and yeah, whenever you're used to being on that kind of winning streak, any kind of loss looks huge. The most important thing is that the Lord is against them. And now they are suffering the same sort of fear that Canaan suffered. So, good point. Um, yes, ma'am. When we were reading back in verse 1 and you said about all the children of Israel, you know, had the guilt of that. Yeah. Remember when Barabbas was there, the people were warning Barabbas and Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, and that's that's a good connection. That, and this is something that I, I think Devana brought I brought it up uh, last week. That the thing about sin is that the the guilt for sin, the, the problems specifically, the problems caused by sin, spread out way further than we intend. Right, like the consequences for sin is way bigger than just us. Uh, you'll sometimes hear people talk about um, 
you know, things that don't affect other people. So why are you opposed to this, that, or the other? It doesn't hurt anybody else. It's just between, you know, it's just this person's choice or it's a choice between these two consenting adults or whatever. And, you know, it doesn't, it's not hurting anybody. And that just shows you people don't understand how sin works. Um, you have this one guy, Achan, who gets greedy. That's what we're going to read later on. He gets greedy. He sees some good-looking stuff, and he takes it. Right? Greed is a common enough sin. It seems private enough. Right? We see it. I mean, there's... I mean, only God could count the number of times that people just, in our own country even, or even... I can't even imagine how many people in our county on a daily basis in, indulge in the sin of greed. Again, it's a number that only God knows. And yet, you look at it, it happens once in Israel and it puts the whole nation at risk because the consequences of sin ripple much further out. Wayne? <coughs> Yeah. Uh, it's just exactly what Solomon was talking about in verse 65. Uh -huh. Amongst these nations you shall find no respite, and there shall be no resting place for the sole of your foot. Uh -huh. But the Lord will give you there a trembling heart and failing eyes and languishing soul. Your life will hang in doubt before you. Night and day you shall be in dread and have no assurance of your life. In the morning you shall say, if only or evening, and evening you shall say, if only or morning, because of the dread that your heart shall feel and the sights that your eyes shall see. Excellent. That is an excellent connection. Because that is precisely what's going on here. And, you know, a lot of times we read the curses in Deuteronomy 28 as something that's going to happen way later on in Israel's history, and specifically that this is going to happen in the context of Israel being taken out of the promised land and deported to other countries, that does happen. Right? That happens with Babylon. That happens with Assyria. Um, and yet here we find it happening even as Israel is in the midst of conquering their home. Uh, that the Lord gives them a trembling heart, a failing eyes, and a languishing soul. And what especially stands out to me in verse 67, this is something to just hang on to for a for a bit. In the morning you shall say, if only it were evening. And at evening you shall say, if only it were morning, because of the dread that your heart shall feel and the sights that your eyes shall see. You know, the fear, the terror is going to be so bad that they're just going to wish that time could just fly away. We're going to see the reverse of this later in the book of Joshua. Right After Israel has gotten this sin situation straightened out, we are going to see the exact opposite happen, where now, instead of saying in the morning, if only it were evening, they're going to become so successful, the Lord is going to be with them so powerfully that they're going to be in the middle of a battle and say, if only we had longer in the day to fight, and the Lord gives them longer in the day to fight. So, excellent connection, Wayne. All right. Let's, we'll finish up today by reading verses 6 through 9 of Joshua chapter 7. Then Joshua tore his clothes and fell to the earth on his face before the ark of the Lord until the evening, he and the elders of Israel, and they put dust on their heads. And Joshua said, Alas, O Lord God, why have you brought this people over, to the, over the Jordan at all? to give us into the hands of the Amorites, to destroy us. Would that, we have been yeah, would that we have been content to dwell beyond the Jordan. O Lord, what can I say when Israel has turned their backs before their enemies? For the Canaanites and all the inhabitants of the land will hear of it and will surround us and cut off our name from the earth. And what will you do for your great name? All right, so Joshua and the elders are in sackcloth and ashes and Joshua prays listen to Joshua's words and 
Tell me what, uh, what this sounds like to you. If you've heard this from the law of Moses before, why have you brought this people over the Jordan at all? It would have been better if we had stayed beyond the Jordan. We're going to be cut off and destroyed. What's that, what's that sound like to you? I saw your hand, Louise. Yeah, it sounds exactly like that. Why did you bring us out of Egypt? It would have been better if we had stayed in Egypt. You just brought us out here to die. Now, what is it in Joshua's prayer that distinguishes what he is saying from what Israel was complaining about in the law? Is there, it, it, does Joshua have any kind of concern that elevates this just beyond a complaint? Rena? Yeah, they're complaining about food. Yeah, why are you going to bring us out here to starve to death or to not have anything to drink? We're going to die. Um, so, I mean, they're, they're complaining. They're whining. Um, what separates Joshua's prayer here from just that kind of whining? Solomon, I thought I saw your hand. Uh, and they said, what would you do your great name? There we go. It's right at the very end of the prayer. Now, it's, it's tied with what he says immediately before then. He says, The Canaanites and all the inhabitants of the land will hear of it and surround us and cut off our name from the earth. In other words, we're going to be killed and we're not going to have any descendants. Right? The sons of Israel will be no more. Our name will be cut off. And what will you do for your great name? And here, now Joshua's prayer becomes more like what Moses would pray instead of the complaint that Israel made. Like, I think this will be a good place for us to stop. Let's, the last thing we're going to look at is Numbers chapter 14, verses 13 through 19, just to see how it compares. Numbers 14, verses 13 through 19. But Moses said to the Lord, then the Egyptians will hear of it. For you brought up this people in your might from among them. And they will tell the inhabitants of this land. They have heard that you, O Lord, are in the midst of this people. For you, O Lord, are seen face to face. And your cloud stands over them. And you go before them in a pillar of cloud by day and in a pillar of fire by night. Now if you kill this people as one man, then the nations who have heard your fame will say it is because the Lord was not able to bring this people into the land that he swore to give it to them, that he has killed them in the wilderness. Now please let the power of the Lord be great as you have promised, saying the Lord is slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, forgiving iniquity and transgression, but he will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and the fourth generation. Please pardon the iniquity of this people according to the greatness of your steadfast love just as you, as you have forgiven this people from Egypt until now. Right. Moses' central concern is the reputation of God. Right? If you kill Israel off, what's, what is everybody going to say about you, Lord? Joshua's prayer becomes the same thing. Right? Again, just starting out, it might strike us as sounding kind of whiny and complaining, but then we discover that, no, this, the concern for all of this is the Lord's reputation. If God is just, has brought this people into the land just to have them die in the land, what's that going to say about God? And that's why Joshua concludes the way that he does. All right, Wayne, then we'll call it. I just believe that this, this is very telling, and this is a way you can know who's who, and who's on the right side of this, who's not. Uh, Senators are always more concerned about themselves. Uh -huh. Very selfish, very self-centered. Yep. Uh, disciples of the Lord, the followers of the Lord, are always very concerned about the Lord. Yeah, concerned about the reputation, the name of the Lord. What he thinks and what he, what he, what he says. You know, they have a custody of the Lord, they have some sinners who are being concerned. Yep. Absolutely. All right. Well, thank you so much for your kind attention and your questions and comments this morning.